This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Agile Architects. This is Enoch, and today is part two of my interview with Mona Quinn, where she takes us behind the scenes of the successful marketing strategy that booked her architecture firm solid in less than four months. Welcome, everybody, to Business of Architecture. I want to welcome back Mona Quinn to the show today. She's talking to us today from New Zealand. She's the principal of New Zealand's leading character home architecture firm. They specialize in renovating and taking care of restoring the beautiful homes in New Zealand. So, Mona, welcome back to the show. Thank you. That's great. Last week, we talked about your background, about uh, how you got your start in Denmark in yes. architecture school, and then met your husband, who is from New Zealand, yes. ended up moving to New Zealand and completing your schooling, and, s and somewhere along the point there, you started your firm. That's right. So could you tell us from the time that from the time that you left school till you started your firm? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that experience and what brought you to land, starting your own firm. I guess yeah. All right. So when you start finish your degree, you think oh I better go out and um, well a get some work. That's the first clincher, isn't it? Sometimes it's quite hard to get work as an architect, so you sort of take what you can get. I did. So I took whatever job I could get and. Um, but after that, I tried to uh, move up and try and work for a big practice because obviously that must be the best thing that it can possibly happen to you working for a big practice. And I did find more and more as I was um, working in the big practices, I ended up taking all the um, heritage homes that were being restored in that practice and ended up working on them. So that was an interesting um, exercise for me. So unbeknownst to me, I was already becoming a specialist in it, even though it wasn't sort of consciously formed in my mind. And um, in terms of uh, trying to get my registration, um, I found that the large practice was very big, busy being a very large practice and not so busy maybe trying to help me get registered. So um, we, um, I decided to leave because I thought I wasn't actually getting the work required for my registration, even though I was very busy heading up this branch of, of uh, restoring all these heritage homes for them. And so I went, I actually went home for my brother's wedding and when I came back the phone was ringing and uh, what had happened while I was away was all the clients that were, I'd been working with on the heritage homes and the heritage restoration of, of their properties in terms of, the, it was character residential pretty much, they all went back and asked, well where's Mona, why is she not? here. Um, we, we don't want to work with you unless she's here. So they had to hire me back on contract at a higher rate, of course. And then I thought, well, if that's the case and that um, even if I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a director or anything, I was just missed a little person in the office and people were ringing up asking for me. I thought, well, there's definitely a reason for me to try and go out on my own and in that vein as well, because obviously I, I had this sort of I don't know if you call it gelling expertise, a gelling ability to make a residential project work because lots of people think, oh, the hardest thing to do is a commercial job, but I find um, it's the other way around. The hardest job to do is a residential job because you, people come with so many emotions, um, what they would like to do, and the process is longer and there's more detail, um, but the challenge and the satisfaction out of it is also great. So Mona, one thing that I'm picking up from what you're talking about is that you have an ability to connect with people, it sounds. It sounds like these clients wanted you back. They wanted to work with Mona. So yes, from right. your perspective, what is your superpower? If you have a superpower, <laughs> what is it? Jokes on site? I don't know. I think, um, or I don't know, it's, I'm not very good at advertising perhaps for myself straight on screen, but people do say I have a, a great communication skills in terms of uh, we talked about this previously but um, in our last um, interview, but about having that ability to get everyone to focus on the end goal and focus on the on the vision for what it is you want to achieve on site and, and, the, and the actual building of that vision and what's the steps required from all parties uh, to make to make that into a successful project. So I think it's maybe it's the um, complete lack of ego <laughs> um, not, not, not necessarily. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's just 
if you if you try and have that vision or mission of trying to create a better place and you try and implement that to people around you, then they become interested in talking to you about that and, and wanting to become part of that. So would it be fair to say that you have a collaborative approach to your relationships? Most definitely. There's no pyramid structure around here. Okay. Okay. All right. So so it sounds like your superpower is being able to collaborate with others, inspire them and and help them yeah, achieve their goals. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to have people try and, and get you to say that about yourself, I guess. Um, I guess it, it, it comes back to having a genuine feeling about something and a genuine wish to do something. And if people see that you have that, then you have it. And then they become attracted to that, I think. And for me, good space is very important. I think it's, uh, and maybe it's my background growing up in, in Copenhagen and biking the streets over there on my little bicycle when I was a student. I don't know, it's just um, all around you there's good space in Copenhagen and, and that how people interact. I mean I had a fantastic teacher when I was at university there, Ian Giel, who is a famous person. I think uh, London has currently hired him to see how they can make their public space better. He came out to New Zealand a couple of years ago and I worked for him over the ho holidays. This was before I started my own practice and he's just such an inspirational man because in reality, what actually happens to humans? I mean, they just want to be happy and they want to be in environments that make them happy. And as much as, oh, let me do one. I know a good example. Um, there's a franchise owner uh, who builds um, versatile sheds. It's just like, you know, the most horrible shed that you can possibly do. But they also make them into houses of people. This guy who owns this franchise, he lives in a beautiful old restored character home himself. So there seems to be this sort of disc disconnection from right I want to make the money but I don't actually want to be in that environment myself so it's sort of almost that idea of having a, a wider responsibility and you could say well that's almost going back to environmental issues and yes it is about environmental issues and about sustainability because if you have an old building that's already been around for 150 years and it's still working and you can still make it work for today's needs isn't that much more sustainable than building um, something which has a 15 year you know, turnaround on it because a lot of the neighborhoods that are being put up in New Zealand at the moment in 50 years I don't think they're there anymore partially because the materials are so substandard and because people are it people move in there with the intent this is my stepping stone to a better place they might not all actually make it out of there but they st keep staying there yeah. exactly. and, and so it goes yeah sorry so they're willing to settle for something that might not be the, the ultimate and sort of look at it as a stepping ladder instead of retaining what they, what they have. Yes, but part of that also comes back to marketing, I think. Because dealing with an architect is seen as a very intricate, complicated process. Mm -hmm. If you buy a phone, um, there's so many market deals and it's so easy to buy a phone. I'm not saying architecture is like buying a phone, but I'm trying to come up with some... Uh, products around us that are so easy to buy um, but if you went back 20 years no one had a mobile phone so what's actually happened you know I still remember when my uncle bought a mobile phone and it was those huge clonkers which was like a massive brick and you had to carry a big box around he was so proud of it maybe architecture are at the the box and the clonking thing that you have to carry around with you stage we haven't made it into something that's easy to understand easy to purchase and easy uh, to have and all around you, whereas the mobile phone has made that quantum leap in what, is it 20 years or 10 years, I don't know, how long, I can't remember how long they've been around. So sometimes it's just if you have that mental push to make something succeed, it already starts succeeding. We've certainly experienced um, just by telling people that we want to grow and that we want, we're passionate about trying to do what it is we, we want to do about restoring old homes and trying to preserve character neighborhoods and character houses in New Zealand. The response you can get out of people, not just clients, but also other industry experts and, um, and people wanting to work with you has been huge. And that's another thing we, we do. We write a monthly newsletter just talking about all these aspects. And it's a great way of, of keeping people in the loop of what's happening. You can tell them about sort of indirectly how great you are, but just from um, telling 
<clears throat> other things you've been invited to or nominated for, as I mentioned to you over the email, we've been nominated for the Business Awards in our local area, uh, which has been really great for us because we're still just a small practice, you know, just me and four part-time staff. It's not like we've got a conglomerate, massive office taking over the world. Maybe right, we are, right, but it's very right. small <laughs> steps at the time. But, um, just from having all these lead generators and from actually being in a position to, to have too much work um, means that we can now, I think monitor, the monitor person you interviewed previously who touched base on that, you can become selective about your do. And from the ability of having too much work to, to then selecting and actually starting to decline people that you're interested in working with sure. or pre-vetting them, sure. it just means that... Um, that you would just continue to grow the upward, you're on the upward spiral and, and I think that's a great, very great place to be. So, sure. so for example, this is my typical day. I've got 25 leads that I need to get back to today, just today, and um, start sending them. They're, they're starting on our little process uh, journey here I, I talked about last time where they get sent various information and if they're not, still not interested, they just go onto the newsletter list, but they're still in our circle of love, so to speak, so we still have contact with them. And we still spread spread the word. So we're already starting to get uh, people who come back that originally didn't take us up on our offer to work with us on the first round, but because they are in the process of being in the circle of love, they come back and ask, oh, actually, we thought about it and, and we would really like to work with you. Excellent. So, so in that short space, we've really only started thinking about this very actively in June this year. Okay. It, it's gone super fast for wow. us. Wow. Wow. How long have you had your firm, Mona? Your own firm? Or been on um, your own? I've been on my own probably since 2009. I started working on contract for my old firm because they had time sure. back. Sure. And then um, I did that for about a year, year and a half, and then I started up Canada's Architects as a, as a proper company in 2010, just because it, we started coming in outside of, of the other practice. So, yes, maybe it was a conscious decision to do it, but it was also, you know, sometimes the opportunity just arises, and, and the, that's the time when you hop in with both feet, I guess. Okay. And you said that one of your, one of your keys to success of your marketing plan has been working with a marketing consultant. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, okay. because... Architects are crap at marketing, I think. Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, we've just never known about it. Um, that's not something that really comes in when you take your degree, does it? And then, again, because we we come out with a sense that we are on par with lawyers and, and doctors and we're necessary for society, but the only problem is that society doesn't know that we're necessary for them. Um, and that's, I mean, it's about education and it's about changing the mindset of a lot of people. Everyone knows they need a lawyer if they you know, cack it and you have to write a will and stuff, but it's just not something that's common knowledge in terms of trying to have a great um, a great house. And, okay. and um, there's lots of other businesses out there trying to tell people that they don't need architects. Absolutely, absolutely. Whereas there's no businesses out there telling people they don't need lawyers. And or doctors. No out there that says that they don't, you don't need doctors. So, so one of our um, sort of jokey... Uh, pictures have been, you know, if you were a, a uh, if you had a kidney failure or something, would you have your mother or your cousin operate you? No, you wouldn't. You would probably go to a surgeon. So we we try and we try to make that comparison with an old home. You know, you open it up and there's wires yeah. and sagging and all sorts of stuff. And but it's been scary in the past how much leverage their mother or sisters, brothers, uncle have in their decision making versus trying to take our recommendations instead but yeah. just from from trying from doing all this marketing and education we don't have that problem anymore so that's awesome. been that's been great for us so let's jump in let's jump into the marketing that that has allowed you to get there so just to rephrase and let everyone know if they're tuning in right now in the middle of the interview for some strange reason we're speaking with yeah. Mona Quinn she's the principal at Calidus Architects in New Zealand Wellington New Zealand and they're an architecture firm that specializes in the restoration and the Preservation. The, the, thank you. <laughs> the preservation of character homes in New Zealand. So, Mona, you mentioned that you work with a marketing consultant, and there's probably some architects out there that are the little light bulbs going off, and they're thinking, oh, that sounds like that's something I'd like to do. Um, yeah. And just to set, to fit, let me finish setting the stage here. Uh, Mona just explained to us that um, with her firm, they're now in the position of being able to basically handpick the clients and the products that they want to work uh, yeah. on. 
which is... And we've, we've just recently put up our fees quite substantially, and it made okay. no difference whatsoever. So that's the other thing you've got to get yourself over. <laughs> so you've, you've raised your fees. Now, this is where um, this whole business of architecture show is going towards, is helping architects figure out how to get where you're at. So it's really great to have you on right now. And there may be these architects who are thinking, okay, how do I go about finding a marketing consultant? They might not know where to start. Can you give yeah. us any suggestions for how you found the person you worked with and what to look for in a marketing consultant? I think it's important to find um, someone who's prepared to, to actually spend the time with you because what we found, the guy we talked to had never tried to launch an architectural practice in terms of marketing and he didn't know of anyone else who had tried to launch an architectural practice in terms of marketing and he'd been in the business for quite some time so you have to sort of uh, spend some time trying to explain this is the other problem architects have they think everyone knows what it is we do and everyone knows what our process is of course they don't and and that's a that's the first thing you have to get into your own head is that no one knows what you do. So take some time out and actually try and explain to the marketing guy, potential marketing guy that, or person or woman that you are going to work with, what it is you do and what the process is. Because if they're used to selling copy machines, um, it takes a little bit of time for them to actually get their head around trying to sell architecture. Because a copy machine, you know, that's a one one-time thing, all right, you might sell a service deal on top of it, but when we get a client on, we work with a client for the first project, probably, you know, one or two years if it's a big project, you know. So so you have to really explain to them what it is you do. And, and by explaining that, you actually explain it to yourself as an outsider, and that, that just starts the whole process of thinking about, well, what is it actually people see you as, and what is it people think that you do? So yeah, it, sometimes we 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 felt like what we've been told that we need to say about ourselves is stating the obvious, because of course everyone knows that. No, they don't. And also, yeah. what you touched base on previously, you know, you you thought it was a, I don't know if you call it long-winded, but it was a long process in terms of converting the leads. I thought it was too. Why can't they just think we're great and hire us on the first, you know, contact instead yeah. of all yeah. this who hiring, pussy footing is what I yeah. would call it yeah. around, but. What actually happens when you do that, and also, um, especially with residential architecture, by drawing out the process a little bit, that gives them time to think about it and time to realize, I'm not actually pushing for a sale here. Yep. So that goes back to, I must be interested. I must have a vision and a mission in terms of making better places. I'm not actually just here to make the money. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm here to make the money, but I would also like to see nicer spaces and nicer environments. And I think most... That's probably why architects don't make so much money because they all are very interested in the better quality product more so than earning the money. If you were an engineer, yes, all right, if you built the new London Bridge or something, that could have great credibility and credo in terms of your popularity as an engineer, but most of the time they're dealing concrete and steel that no one sees. So their, I don't say, love of the job is maybe a little bit different in that respect. Yeah. So then, then they're not so you know I'm not going to do it for nothing sort of thing. Well, that that is that is something that that frequently that I hear and that people talk about in the online space and social media and Twitter is the fact that as architects, most of us are really passionate about what we do. You yes. know, there's a there's a higher there's a higher goal involved, and so you're right. I think that um, because of that, it sort of reduces. I've seen how it reduces our bargaining at the table a little bit because we just want to. We want to do the project so badly, sometimes we yeah. undervalue ourselves, I find. You have so, to turn that around and make that into your strength. I think it's it's the ba it's the greatest tool we have that we are actually passionate about something. And that's also why architects are so exciting to talk to, you know, yeah. even if slightly Absolutely. Weird, weird in the head sometimes. Well, tell me how you've um, taken that and made it your strength, Mona. Tell me how you've used that principle. So, for example... Um, I think it was in our last interview, we talked about the Christchurch Cathedral and the earthquakes in New Zealand. So we've turned it around and said, well, we want to try and do something to save this. So we do these seminars. Uh, we are part of the money, if people pay to come along to them, we'll go to try and save the Christchurch Cathedral. That is a mission. But what actually happens is 
people come along to the seminar and fill out the form because obviously they hear about what we have to say and want to know more because we offer this free booklet. So all of a sudden, it's without them knowing it, they get into our system and become one of our leads. It's, it sounds terribly like you're a devil or something like that, but, <laughs> but what we've used is that we've used our mission as a, as, as a point of, of getting people to come and talk to us. Okay. But at the same time, we use the marketing strategies for them to, so that we can indoctrinate them, I guess is what you could say, into our way of operating and our system. So when it actually comes to the fees, um, that's almost a byproduct in terms of the journey that we would like to take them on. And, it, and, then, sure. and that's sort of the next stage in terms of, so you have the whole lead generation process and the lead conversion process. But then, as I said previously, we have, you know, the one to two year working relationship until a product is finished. So that's sort of the next stage that's called a remarkable client experience. And that's what we're working on at the moment. How can we make that journey, which is normally incredibly stressful, for um, especially for residential clients and time consuming and et cetera, et cetera. How can we make that easier for them? And and by actually helping them out with some of those and attaining value to make some of that, all of that decision making, you know, if we helped you with it or if we did that and consequently charged you more for it, yeah, sure. um, then, then that process could be a really enjoyable experience. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. Well, but again, it comes back to that you have to try and and, put, and teach them or educate them about the value that you do so so that you don't end up just going for free to the lighting shop with them, helping them select lights, because that's your time. You know, you should be charging that out at X, Y, Z amount of dollars an hour, because yeah. if you just do it for free, it's got no value for, for them. And the other thing that we've been told and was told very much by the marketing guy, people don't go for the cheapest product. Let me just take the mobile phone analogy again. Um we'll probably all have an iPhone or something to that effect. That's certainly not the cheapest phone in the market. I would say it's most expensive, but we, especially as architects, because we like design and style, yeah. uh, we will purchase one of those, haven't we? We mm -hmm. haven't bought the cheapest Nokia at 45 bucks or whatever they cost. Well, let, let, me, let me interject here, Mona, because I see where you're going with this, and this is a very interesting conversation that you're, that you're talking about. Um, here in the states, I don't know down there in New Zealand, but here we call that we call it commoditization. I think if yeah. I'm saying correctly, but basically the fact that you know when you have cell phones, uh, as architects, we need to differentiate ourselves somehow. We need yeah. to not be a commodity, and yes. I think that's that's where you're going with this. So a lot of architects I've spoken with have difficulty seeing or making that case for value. Yeah. Of differentiating the, themselves. The problem with that is that we have fear of not getting the jobs. Mm -hmm. If you if you met the first thing I would do because I didn't set my fees up straight away, I did it when I had too much work. Mm -hmm. So so because then I think well I've already got another fifty leads coming next week from this other thing I'm doing. So I'm just gonna uh, put my fees up now because rather than saying no, it's much better to put my fees up and then continue it upwards but if you if you price your concept drawings to the same cost that um, say a, a franchise home builder would do for a concept for a client why why would they go with you why what's the value you can do it's the same value yep. and the house will be cheaper to build but it's just architects are very keen to get the work and they would love to do it so they think oh if I just squeeze my price down a little bit they will take me on but actually what happens is the opposite I mean it, it's such a nerve-wracking thing to do but um, I mean, we put our fees up by 30%, which is a huge number, and we're going to continue to evaluate it. You know, it, uh, someone said this phrase to me the other day: "If you take care of the pennies, the pounds take care of themselves." We don't have pennies and pounds in New Zealand anymore, but it is true though, because if you could just add a 5% increase in your fees, or in some com component of your fees, mm -hmm. um, that that uh, makes a huge difference because you're still okay. doing the same work. We're actually just being paid a little bit extra for it. Sure, okay. The other thing so, we are working into our contracts at the moment is that uh, is the deposit. Normally, architects don't ask for a deposit. Everyone mm -hmm. asks for a deposit. You know, yeah. I just bought carpet recently. They wanted an 80% deposit up front before they came to put it in. I thought it was outrageous. Mm -hmm. So we charge all concept drawings and concept we, – we package it up. That's the other thing. you got to package it up. This comes back to the deal. You know, we're selling a mobile phone. It sounds – 
don't know if you sound it doesn't sound very sophisticated but we're talking about marketing today right, right? so that's right we will take a little bit of some of that sophistication out of it of course it comes across as being a little bit more sophisticated when we pitch it to our clients but it comes back down to packaging up the deal so we have a three stage process so initially we sort of do the the search and assessment of, of their property. So that's the sort of initial consultation. Then we move on to, rather than just doing concept drawings, we do a, a concept package for them. Um, because there's a lot of people, again, it comes back to the emotion, the emotive brief, the actual brief of what is it they want to do, especially with residential. That, that whole stage needs much more time and effort spent on it. And, and people think, oh, they're not going to pay for that. But if you sell it to them as, as of course this is the most important stage why, sh why shouldn't you be paying more money for it why you know this is really important this is about your home and where your kids are and where you're going to grow up and have all your family memories why isn't this important to you yeah and once you turn that around people are just but again because we've defined what our usp is we can do that we can we can package it up very specifically to that if we were just a generalist architect you couldn't go in and start talking about residential emotional values at that stage okay. so you have to you have to jump the 10 steps previously to where we were initially in our conversation and and take that conversation with yourself and your practice of where you want to pitch yourself sure so now, but anyway some... so going back down to this concept package and once that's sorted out and people are happy with it and yes it takes longer and you as an architect in the past would be so frustrated why can't they just make up their mind so that we can build them up bill but we've already asked for a deposit so in terms of that we are fine and we actually would like them to be a bit slow in terms of making up their minds because we're so busy so sure. that's the other thing you gotta you gotta actually take on 150 percent of work because so then you can afford you can afford to allow the clients to be slow once they sure. do sign on with you they, you know, they always underestimate how much time they take to get back to you. So, so, so then the best thing you can do is actually be so busy so that you don't ring them up every five minutes to ask where they are with their decisions. They ring you back, you know, so they get the idea, oh, actually, we have to push it ourselves if we want this done. So, so again, yeah. you could become, you put yourself in the driver's seat, I guess is what you could say. Yeah. And then on, onwards from the, our concept package, then we do the, the construction or the whole, the rest of the package, and it um, still gets charged with a, a deposit, not as much as the concept, obviously, but um, just just to sort of keep, you know, that comes back to talking about cash flow, another thing unbeknownst to architects normally, um, but it's all about, yeah, how do you offset the, the mission vision versus running the, the business as a, pra you know, practice as a business. Great. Well, this is great, Mona, because this is this is a great case study right now because we're we're get, you're getting a sneak peek at a a well-oiled machine. It sounds like you've started to put in these marketing things into place in your business, and you have a a marketing funnel that's actually working for you. It's actually bringing in yep. clients automatically um, with a little bit of effort on your part. You've already produced yep. the materials, and it's just it has momentum, and so it's going to keep on growing. Tell me yep. about tell me about what is a USP, and how you went about developing yours. So USP is, I didn't know anything about USP before, uh, four, four or five months ago. So USP is what's your unique selling point, what's your pitch? And uh, it's, it's scary that we haven't thought about it before in our practice. And it's scary that hardly any architects talk about it, uh, even the large practices. If I went into the previous huge practice I worked for and asked them, what's their USP? I think I have a couple of ideas now what their USP should be, but it should, they shouldn't even be bothering about heritage restorations or character homes because I reckon in my opinion that's slowing them down having to deal with both this incredibly time consuming residential stuff versus these huge educational um, facilities they're building for other clients so so you know they're trying to be everything to everybody and and large practices are still trying to be everything to everybody. You know, these guys got satellite offices in four different towns, and they're still trying to be everything to everybody. So, yeah, it, but it just takes courage, doesn't it? It takes courage to say, no, I'm not going to do this job because I'm not going to make any money of it. But you just, you got to take a step outside of, of the box or of the practice and say, well, actually, is this job going to get me my next job that I would really like to do? Because my avatar or my best client would be this guy and if I have done a garage alteration is he going to come and hire me because of that job no he's probably not so it comes back to also 
we, we spend a, too much time treating all our clients the same. And we should, if we get the right clients, we should just spend time on them. And actually, yes, still follow up to the, to the smaller ones, but I normally just put our fees up and generally just say no and go away. Or if they continue to go on, obviously they have become educated and committed people, just like my aunt and uncle in Denmark who wants an architect for a one-room extension. So, um, you know, and then they're a joy to work with because then they're, they're committed to and you're still going to make money out of it. Excellent. So we have... So take me through the process. Let's see if we can just get a really broad overview. You've already given it to us once before, but I'm just going to yep. rephrase it here. So we have you're developing your USP, which is your unique selling point, your unique selling proposition, what differentiates you from others. You mentioned that you have a goal of having seven, was it seven lead generators functioning? Ten. We, we are Ten. on five at the moment, I think, yeah. Okay, you're on five. Ten maybe too much because it's, it's already quite busy, yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, so you're at five right now. And I'll just run yep. through those. What you said that you have a relationship with franchise renovators who are other builders in the area. Yep. And yep. that's sort of your bread and butter, um, your baseline. Yep. And then you have key refers, referral partners. Yes. What industries are these referral partners in? Uh, it's it's all about relationships, really. Some of them are other builders that do good good quality work. Um, but again, just because architects have shot themselves in their feet so much lately, most clients, a lot of people go to a builder first, you know, for a project. They don't go to an yeah. architect. So, sure. so that's not a good way. So you can find some good quality builders in your neighborhood and try and set up, you know, just get, spend some time driving out to see them and having a chat, drink their horrible cups of tea or whatever it is they're eating on the building site. And um, just see that, you you know, you're there about, the, you, you're just as interested in what they're doing as as uh, as being in your flesh office, not that it's this flesh here behind me at the moment, but so um, just invest some time in trying to get some key referrers that are interested in working with you. Look around in your local neighbourhood. Who, if once you've sorted out what your USP is, then it opens up your eyes to find people that may be of interest to you. So I'll just try and, and uh, quickly run off a number of people. So we have a um, Another guy I work with is a is a builder, but he runs a franchise heritage. You know, it's replica homes of yesteryear, which is, sounds terrible. But um, we're actually just currently working on doing a six property development with him. We wouldn't have gotten such a big job unless we had previously established our USP and worked out. So all right, it might not be the most uh, award-winning project yet, but it will still be nice homes for people um, that we're building. Um, the other, we're also talking to a planning and surveying company because they specialize a lot in subdivisions of pro old properties. And old properties often have really large tracts of land around unless they haven't been chopped up previously. Again, old homes, you know, back to the USP, what is it we're doing? Um, so we have a working relationship with them. We, do, we run dual advertising together in other magazines, etc. Um, well, yeah, so we have some um, previous architects who are now retired, but still, you know, you go out, spend coffee, drink tea with them, because people still ring them up. You know, they're at the tail end of their careers. So they've already set up all their referrals, more or less unconsciously. So that's that's great for us. So we've just landed a really large um, job in two years' time uh, in Wellington through one of those um, retired people. You know, so, so they still want to work on it, but they just don't want all the hassle of running an old practice. And the greatest thing about that is, um, you get to work with someone who has been through all the ropes and you can learn a lot from them. And that, and that, I think that's the other thing you got to, well, for me it's been important is that, I don't know if you call it humility or just willingness to hear or to listen to what people, you know, if you're willing to listen, then they're willing to tell you and then after that they're actually willing to forward you work. So Wonderful. So it's just, yeah, b uh, builders, other older architects, and just other people in the industry, which is relevant to what to what you're doing. <clears throat> so, I mean, structure engineers, we also get work through them. So so we send our newsletters to them. We try and have them as our key referrers. And previous clients is sort of the next rung down of, of, of the key referrers. And then we run our newsletter, which is another lead generator in terms of um, people who may have contacted us and came through the uh, the sort of initial selling process but didn't actually decide to be a client at that point in state. Uh, time, but they, then they're still in the circle of love, so we still sort of keep in contact with them, and some of them have already come back and said, oh, well, look, you know, we've had time to think about it, and now we really want to go ahead, and because we keep hearing from you, obviously you spring to mind first, so that, that's quite good for us.
Interesting. Well, you have you have a lot. I love how the language you you defined your marketing through a certain language. Like you talk about the circle of love, things that are very descriptive. You you sort of coined these phrases. One of the things that you talked about was the monkey's fist. What's the origin of the monkey's fist? There, there's a story that goes along with that, right? Why they call it the monkey's fist? Yeah, it's it's um I have been told this. I think it was a, a guy who was selling dishwashers or cars or something in America um many years ago. I can't remember the name of him, but he was he was not selling anything. He was despairing, thinking about throwing himself off into the sea. No, not quite. Um, <laughs> and he was watching a cruise ship coming into dock on on the harbour. And then he he looked at this huge rope coiled on on the deck, and the massive anchor. And he thought, well, how or oh, the huge rope? How am I going to get? How are they going to throw this over? It? it weighs a ton, you know. Throw this massive rope over and and hook it up to the bollard. But what actually happened was they they threw a skinny rope, which at the end had this knot, uh, which the sailor then on the on the dock caught, and then he used the little rope to pull over the incredibly heavy rope and then tie it onto the bollard. And and what in sailors' terms, apparently that little knot is called the monkey's fist. So if you have a monkey's fist. So you have to see this is your free element in your marketing, and then that huge, uh, you know, ton of money, the massive cold rope, that that is your fee that you can could potentially get out of that. That is such a beautiful and descriptive story. And one thing I love about stories so much, Mona, is that there's so much meaning behind them. Because as I hear you tell that story, I'm thinking of that huge coiled rope as the challenge of selling an architectural project. Because like yeah. you said, the stakes are high, it's a lot of money clients are spending, it's a long process of building trust. That's a big yeah. rope. And yeah. so you have you have a smaller rope, in other words, the monkey's fist that you attach to that, that brings the client along that yes. process of selling. Yeah. Right. That's right. And and the other the other aspect I think I mean we haven't quite finished with what other lead generators we're having, well we just keep talking, that's all right. Um Yes, the coiling of the rope, but the other aspect to that is also the respect for, if we keep with the cruise ship rope terminology, the guy throwing the rope and, and the person pulling it in. So maybe you're the one pulling them in, so to speak, but you also have to have a respect for the for the guy on the ship. Because especially in residential terms, um, it's a lot of money, as you, as you just mentioned. And, and another pitch that we market is, well, we don't want to... Um, uh, we, it, it's about the slowing down of the marketing process, right? So, so in terms of slowing down our our selling our service, selling our fees, you know, because everyone wants to get to the construction and drawing stage because that's where a lot of the money is because it's a, a larger amount. But we say no, we're not going to rush into this. We want to make sure that this project in our concept drawing packages can meet what you want to spend. So that means that often it takes another like month of of farting around or you know getting a curious look at it so we got different price again goes back to the mobile phone packaging up different ways of getting the project price depending on how they would like to put the project through to completion and and from us actually saying oh we don't want to do it until it's been priced so that you can be assured that you can afford it they're not used to um, architects saying that they think gosh why is she saying that you know if she's actually interested in, in delivering us a project we can afford, whereas normally architects try not to talk about money uh, too much because they're too scared it will kill off the project. What we've only received incredibly positive responses from our clients from that. And repeat and, what that is because the sound was sort of getting out a little bit. Oh, sorry. Just, just um, putting a halt to the process, wanting to make sure they can actually afford the concept package because it, what often happens is that you know they agree to the concept, everyone's friends, it's all happy, and then we we draw it all up and it goes out for pricing and it comes back at twice the price and everyone's unhappy. Mm -hmm. And the architects, because everyone's unhappy, redraw it all you know at very limited cost or for free, depending on how bad we feel about it. And that that's a big problem. You know, it, it's not actually helping you as a practice. So it's much easier to actually do that whole, now we're going to wait, and it might take us a month longer to get this project priced up or renegotiate it down, but it's a downside faster to do at concept stage where it's it's changing sketches around or it's changing you know, a SketchUp model around, etc., uh, rather than having to do it when, when you have already received your billing consent and, and it's a massive undertaking to, to change it all. So, exactly. so clients react very positively to that, I find, saying that, you know, I'm not interested in fleecing you out of everything you own. 
I'm interested in delivering a result that meets your expectations. And what's interesting is yeah. that then the price comes back and it's too high and then they say, well, what would you like to do about it? And all of a sudden they actually have to take the things out rather than feeling like they're forced to do it because yeah. they can't afford it so that we end up having to take the things out. So again, it comes back to them and, and I can't have a client at the moment and I think they're slowly dawning on them that they're actually holding up the whole process. But mm -hmm. it's taken them two months to realize that because in the past they thought we would be the ones wanting to rush them along. But again, because we have so much work and we have so many leads, we don't need to rush them to get the job, to get the commission. We can just let them stew on it, I guess is what Wonderful. you could say. And then them to realize that it has to come from them. Mm -hmm. We can't pull over their heads what it is they want. As much as we would like to, and mm -hmm. as much as we would tell them what's good for them, um, you have to just get that respect for the client and the, the client's money. You know, we all yeah. know how long it takes to earn 150 grand. It takes quite a long time. Mm -hmm. It does. What? How? How long? Did, how much um, time and investment did it take Mona to put together this system? Because it sounds like it's pretty involved. I mean, from what you've told me so far, you you talked about your marketing system. You've talked about each individual little step of the process, and you've actually broken it down into lead generators, and then you've broken those lead generators down to specific people or specific gift items or things that you yep. give them. And then you yep. talked about your remarkable client experience, so you've actually set yes. this goal for having this client experience. I mean, yep. it would take me a month to try to think of all that. I mean, how, how much, generally how much money and time, just kind of give us an idea of the investment you spent developing this for your practice. It has taken a lot of time, uh, but as with everything, you know, if you do the preparation, the after, the benefits after has been so great that it has greatly outweighed the time and money investment. Sure. But um, the thing about this, as with every marketing exercise for any business, is you can't do it half-heartedly, and you can't do it ad hoc. You have to sit down from the beginning and that comes back to defining your USP. If you haven't got that, you know, then it's it's not there's not much point in doing any of this. So you have to commit yourself and say, well look, this is what we're gonna do and, and for us it was forking out the exuberantly large fee to this marketing guy. I thought, flipping heck, if we're gonna pay him that, we're definitely giving it all we've got. Yeah. So, you know, we we probably spent three months of working incredibly hard so because it's me who was the boss, so I worked in the evenings and weekends. Um, the benefit of that though was because you try to turn it around really quickly, is that you become immersed in the whole way of thinking and then once you've actually produced the first couple of items, it becomes much faster and quicker yeah. to keep it going. Yeah. Do, the other do, thing do that your marketing... we have... Sorry, go ahead. The other thing we uh, invested in after two months of frustration on the computer because yes, we're good at AutoCAD drawings, but we're terrible at um, marketing graphic design, you know, I don't know anything about that. So we hired a graphic designer and that's been the absolute godsend because now I can just, the words are in words and I've sent her the pictures and she just puts it all together and the beauty of that is she is able to deliver us this consistent image. So she's designed every material, every, you know, everything from how, what the letterhead is, how it all works, you know, what's the gift painting going to look like, et cetera, et cetera. And it just makes, Gives, it frees up my time so I can just do that, actually do the, the work. But it's just, it, that sort of comes back to branding. Normally you spend too much time and too much money on branding. But um, if, if you get the lead generation and you get the, the marketing in terms of getting the work, then all of a sudden it makes sense to have a coherent and consistent image. But again, you've got you to gotta earn some money so that you can start paying her for that as well. And, and the other thing probably say, people say, um, did you say, oh my God, it's so time consuming. I'll never get around to it. Now it takes me probably an hour to, to do the information required for the newsletter. I send it off to her. She spends 20 minutes on it and it's done. We can send it off to the printers. And, you know, it goes out to 200 potential clients at the moment, which is great for us considering the size we are. So, um, yeah, you just, I mean, it's it's a lot of effort, but if you if you don't do it, you know, that's why no one else is doing it. It's because it takes that amount of effort to upfront. So it yeah, um, in terms of hours, you asked how many hours, I don't know. And also um, let me interject and say, how much of that was spent one-on-one -on -one with the marketing consultant and then did he give you the framework and then turn you loose and you had to come up with the specific action items or did he develop it with you to map out this framework? 
So what? Yeah. So what happened? I, I'm I'm sort of all gun hose normally as a person. So I said, oh, well, if it, if this is going to work, we're going to try and do it really fast because there's not much point floundering around forever and then get to Christmas and it's not working. Yeah. Um, and I've spent a lot of money. So so I met with him once a week for two hours, and then we emailed and phoned if required. Uh, and then we had an action plan. I had to email him an action plan at the end of that day. So we set goals for each week, and then I just, you know, I had to work every weekend to try and meet those goals because it, you busy working. I have three kids myself, you know, so it's um, so all around, all of all of that. But because you're doing it really fast, you know, it's only it's like MasterChef. I don't know if you have that program here. They work so hard in the in the kitchen. They're we do, we do, we love it. Twelve yeah. weeks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so. So it's worth it hitting it hard and going full on because if you if you just try and do a little bit all the time, it sort of becomes a bit half-hearted or you you don't see the results as fast maybe so that you feel it's worth the expense. Um, so what's ha so what's happened is so we did um, three months of intensive operations with this guy and have had most of it set up now. So now we've gone to a monthly club of, but what's been really great about this he, it's a sort of his build on package you can become a member of this more exclusive club he says um, but it's actually with lots of other people so we are a, a group of uh, I think 12 who is all no, have all been through the process. None of the other ones are architects, but that's actually great. So we got builders, we got people who do relocatable homes, we got PR consultants and real estate agents and stuff. But because they all know the process and have been through that marketing exercise, then um, they all instantly know what it is you're talking about. So so on on Friday, I have to give the presentation about what our business has been up to and what's our latest practices. And it just forces you to think about it all the time, uh, which is good. Not not that you always think so when it's one o'clock in the morning and you have to <laughs> finish stuff, but it is it you have to commit to it and you also have to put aside time for it. Um, but just thinking about oh I'll give it to Christmas and see how far I get, you know. So you put a time limit on it as well. Excellent, Mona. What would you say would be the two biggest aha moments you've had out of this marketing process? The two biggest aha moments. Um, the two biggest aha moments for me has been, if you're going to get a 15 grand fee out of this, why aren't you spending $500 on your client up front? That that's um, that's been the biggest thing for me to think about because I would say, why am I spending $500? That's so much money. But if you get, you know, it's 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 the changing changing around of that thinking in your mindset. Um, of course, you have to have some money to, in the beginning to do that because you're not getting the fee straight away. But it's, it's having that belief in the system that it is going to work because it's only going to work if you implement all the things that you're being told to implement. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just that whole thinking. Of course, you know. So the other thing we do once once they've received our fee proposal and we don't hear from them, or even if we will be heard from them within that following week, we send. I go to the bookstores here and buy. Because you know you meet your client by then, so you know what they like, what sort of people you've seen their home. I go, I just go buy 20 books at a time. Some of them are in interior design, some of them are about landscape because we do landscaping as well, and sort of try to tune a book to their personality. So I just send that for your charge. You know, it cost me 50 New Zealand dollars to do it, but it's nothing. It's peanuts, isn't it? If you're going to earn yeah. a big fee, but people, the reaction you get out of people from sending this book is huge. They just can't believe it. You know, awesome. oh great! You sent me a book for fifty dollars. I'm going to sign you on for three and a half grand. Oh, perfect! Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of, um, but it's that it's the mindset of 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 course it's fine to spend money on clients because they're going to spend money with you. That's that's been the biggest one for me. And the other one is um, he's made this millionaire matrix calculation thing because unbeknownst to me, I thought that you had to get in the old, in the old days, I thought you had to get every job you came through the door. Mm. Obviously, you know, and and maybe I would get ten or twenty, uh, what do you say, contacts a week. And if I didn't get every single job, I would be depressed and drink too much coffee or wine on Friday nights. Um, but actually, what I realised is that, oh, all right, to earn this amount of income, I have to have three hundred leads for work a year. I have to pre-vet them through to maybe twenty meetings, and out of those, I have to get ten really well-paying clients. And that whole notion of understanding that that's what's required so then you can plan your year in terms of how many seminars you're going to do, how many articles you're going to try and get in the newspaper, how many ads you're going to place, all of a sudden it becomes a numbers game so that you can actually plan your income, whereas before 
you know we were just hoping we could get whatever we could get and 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 from realizing that you can set it up so it's a it's a numbers game or is a system to predetermine your income for the following year in an architect business you know flip and heck who's ever thought about that that's um that's been a huge thing for us to actually it, it, it's been a huge boost and a huge confidence i guess Excellent. Well, Mona, it's been an awesome interview. We've talked a lot about money. We've talked a lot about business. There's been talk of millionaires and monkey's fists and USPs. But at the same time, you also mentioned that there's a higher purpose to what you're doing and that you're not doing this simply because of the money, but that the money allows you to do what you want to do. So my last question is going to be, what's the future for Calidus Architects and how are you going to change the world? Uh, I think uh, my greatest... Um, I think if, I think I will have achieved success if in 10 to 15 years time I'll be walking down a street of in New Zealand and um, or reading the newspaper maybe that would be better and and actually seeing conversations and articles and people being passionate about design and architecture to the same extent that what's being published and talked about and written about in um, Denmark. So I'll give you a little example. I come from a very, um, I don't come from Copenhagen originally, I come from a small town and it's, it's a population of 5,000 people which is, you know, fairly small. Um, in that town we have three, bus uh, three businesses or three shops purely selling design items for your home. This is not talking about, you know, um, the supermarket having a sideline of, of stuff for your home. This is actually purely exquisite, expensive items for your home that you can buy to decorate or furnish. It's not even talking about furniture shops, this is just the sign. And this is in a little shop of three of uh, 5,000 people. If you went to a, a town in New Zealand of 5,000 people, you wouldn't find that at all. You know, you might find a gift shop, which have have anything from Auntie Peace, sweet tea or something like that, to um, something else. But we're talking about high quality items here. So. I'm not thinking, I don't think New Zealand will get to that stage just as fast, but just for everyone to actually have joy and um, caring about good spaces, good environments and good design, and that that becomes just as valued as everything else, I think that would be a great achievement for me. I'm not saying I'm going to do that on myself, but if at least I could keep that conversation and start that somewhere or just get the ball rolling with it, that would be great for me. That sure. would be successful. Well, you, you have already demonstrated that you seem to have a knack for starting conversations. So uh, thank you for the wonderful too conversation, fast, too Mona. Much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But we've really appreciated it, and it's been a pleasure having you on Business of Architecture. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work. expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, guarantee, promise, agreement, affirmation, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, commitment, except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.